follow me, and I believe and I've seen as, as we've walked through Matthew, Christ is really emphasizing the teaching of his disciples here at this time. We're going to see another aspect to where Christ wanted to lead them here. We've seen follow me to the common people. We've seen follow me to doctrine with application. Follow me to faithfulness. Follow me to glorify God. Last week it was follow me forward. And in, in reviewing that, we talked about pressing forward when things are seemingly always working against you. And more and more, it seems every day, things seem to be working against the Christian. But, but Christ encourages us to follow. And in that chapter, chapter 10, he highlights the provision of God. And that's really important for us to remember when we start to think about the things that we can be lacking and we can struggle with and we can suffer in this time. God's always going to be providing us a way, an, an out. He's always going to be providing us an escape, um, the things that we need. And we're going to see some of that as we walk through the next passage uh, later on today. <clears throat> but specifically here, I'm dealing with follow me. And when he says go forward, who's he talking about going forward to? He's talking about going forward to reaching the world sorry it's a little bit cold in here this oil heater is really going if you wanted to sit beside it you'd probably get some good heat there and I, she's she's just racing towards that thing now <laughs> there's a little one behind you but it's not doing the best but that that one's good anyways i'm in matthew chapter 11 and we're looking at follow me to the world here in matthew chapter 11 we begin in verse 1 it says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence, watch this, to teach and to preach in their cities. I believe here he's talking about specifically those twelve disciples and their cities. So where they lived, where they resided, those that knew them most and where they lived. He goes to teach and preach specifically in the cities of these twelve disciples, I believe to highlight a transition that's taking place. Now people often teach and, and say that Christ came to be the Savior of the Jews and that everything else was an afterthought. But I believe right here in Matthew chapter 11, we're going to see a very different story. Christ is actually sending his disciples into the world and saying, follow me along in this journey. Here, the disciples, in the uh, specifically these twelve, are going to get to experience real-world examples of what they were previously charged and commanded. Jesus charged them, preach and give. We talked about that last week. In Matthew chapter 13, look over with me, Matthew chapter 13, and in verse 57, we're dealing with his disciples going and doing a good work, preaching and giving unto others. And we saw that there was some pushback to that, there's also going to be some offense that's caused as a result. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 57, it says, And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So here Jesus is going to go to the different places where the disciples lived, and in the example in Matthew chapter 13, he specifically went to the place where he lived. This is when they charged him as being just the carpenter's son. This is, this is Mary's boy. All of his brethren are here. And they were offended at his preaching and teaching. And Jesus said, look, a prophet is not without honor. A prophet can be honored in, in, in any time, save in his own country and in his own house. That's usually where it falls flat. Prophets are quite often not welcome in their own place. And Jesus here had that same example back in Matthew chapter 11. He's now going to the places where the disciples resort. And he's going to give us an example here, a case study of John the Baptist and what it was to go unto your own and how they would receive it. John the Baptist there in verse 2 is discussed. It says, Now when John had heard in or now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent his two disciples, continue reading, and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be 
offended in me. So I've talked about this before, but I believe that John the Baptist here wasn't doubting, wasn't in a state of unbelief. He wasn't the one that was offended here. Rather, he used this opportunity to tell his disciples, hey, why are you hanging out with me in prison? Go to Christ. That was, Je that was John's whole ministry. Go to Christ. Seek after Christ. He pointed as a forerunner to Christ in every aspect of his ministry. And as a result of many hearing, many were offended. But also many that heard John the Baptist did exactly what he said. They went and followed Christ. So here these disciples receive of that good news from Jesus' own mouth that, hey, the blind are given sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, these wonderful miracles and the greatest miracle of all. The poor have the gospel preached unto them. Don't be offended in these things. Now Jesus begins to teach of John the Baptist here. In verse 7, it says, And as they departed, being the disciples headed back to John to give the news, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. John is referred to here as more than a prophet, and I believe he was. He was the forerunner for Christ. He was the one that went before Christ in that transition period from Old Testament to New Covenant, Christ entering in. He went before him as that forerunner pointing to Christ and telling everybody to seek the one that should come. He was a man with a mission, and verse 10 highlights that. He was prophesied when the Bible says in verse 10, for this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. That was taken from Malachi 3, verse 1. That same quote. So <clears throat> he went as a prophesied prophet and fulfilled that destiny as it was written. Now, as I said, John here used this opportunity to teach his disciples, I believe. I don't think he was doubting, but rather discipling. And he was really great at this. He was, he was humble in his delivery. And it was John the Baptist that said, He must increase, I must decrease, with respect to Jesus Christ. Verse 11 it continues and says, Verily I say unto you, Christ talking of John, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This wonderful disciple was humble as always. And humble John, I believe, would have been okay with that position. Being least in the kingdom of God as long as Christ was exalted. That was his whole purpose. That was his whole ministry, was exalting Christ and, and, and prophesying of his coming. I believe here, though, what is referring to as him being least in the kingdom of heaven, it's talking about the expected end of the saved. John here is still stuck in prison. And as great of a man as he is, and as great of a ministry as he had, he is still least then the least in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, they are greater. They have reached their expected end. They have risen to that point of sainthood in heaven with God. This is indicating, I believe, that there is a greater purpose beyond what happens here. The greatest of ministers can look at their greatness here as being about nothing there in heaven compared to the people that have ascended and rose up. In verse 12, it continues and talks about this, um, this saying. It says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So this is an often um, debated verse because that word violence is there. And if you look in the Bible, violence is always a bad thing. It's a violation of something. But here... It may not be the case. We know that, as it's referred to here, 
the days from John the Baptist until now, is what he's talking about. So from John the Baptist ministry beginning until Jesus here standing as John is in prison and being prepared to lose his head for the sake of Christ, he says, from John's preaching until now, the kingdom suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Now given the rest of the context of the chapter, I believe what he's talking about is a press coming in to the kingdom of heaven. Think of all the times, even to date, that Jesus had has had to evade the multitude. He's had to tell people, I healed you. Praise the Lord for that. Go and, and, and give the offering that is needed, but don't tell anybody. Because he's purposely trying to avoid the press that is coming to him. Suffereth violence, that kingdom of heaven suffering violence. I believe this is the great multitude pushing and, and battling and struggling to get to the salvation that God is offering. Now, when we think of this, we, we, we go, well, how could that be? Because most people here are rejecting it. But there's a new group that Christ is now referring to, that they're not rejecting it. By and large, they're actually clamoring to get to the kingdom of heaven that's being promised through Christ. From the time of John to Jesus, there's now a press that is violently taking the kingdom of heaven by storm, trying to get in there. Now, it's true, and if you go into verse 13, it says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So there's another time frame that's being dealt with the prophets and the law up until John. It's true that they were the ones that prophesied and told of what's to come. But look at the results of that area in time. Verse 14, it says, And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. One group from John till Jesus is causing the kingdom of heaven to suffer violence for, for the press that's coming upon it. The other group, Jesus has to specifically say, this is that same Elias who was not well received. And he says, if you have ears to hear, hear what I'm saying. Keep your finger there and right at the beginning of your New Testament, just before that is Malachi and verse chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. And this is the phrase that's being referred to when Christ says, if ye will receive it. If ye desire to receive this, this is that very Elias which was for to come. If you have ears to hear, listen to what I'm saying here. In Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, the Bible reads, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, what I believe, and you can go back to Matthew chapter 11, and this is referring to, is a time of reconciliation. John came to reconcile God's people to the Lord Jesus Christ when he arrived. But what happened? Well, did they have ears to hear? No, they heard it not. Did they receive what he was teaching? Absolutely not. They did not. The prophets and the law were received by rebellion, by and large. People rejected what God was teaching them in that time frame. So again, here we have John to Jesus, the kingdom suffering violence as the press tries to enter in. And the context is going to give us more um, clues about that, more indication that, that that's what it's referring to. The next passage is from the prophets until John. They're not receiving that reconciliation. They don't have ears to hear, and that's going to play out in the rest of the passage. Verse 13, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The prophets and the law, then comes John trying to bring reconciliation, trying to prepare a people to receive the Lord. But how well are they receiving him when he's cast into prison for the words that he preached? And then it says, if you have ears to hear, you can hear. It's yours to receive, but what was the response? Let's continue down in verse 16. Christ says, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. 
For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. So how did those receive it? That Christ said, Hey, you have the law, you have the prophets. This is Elias, which was for to come, prophesied at the end of your law and your prophets. If you have ears to hear, hear this now. They said to him, well, we did such and such. We did this and that. We did all of these works of the law, and ye didn't do what we expected. Look at, look at these spoiled, rotten children as Christ compares them to. They said, we did all these great things. You didn't give us what we wanted. They rejected it outright. And that's what Christ likens this generation unto. Spoiled, rotten kids that did what they thought was right. Good works, good deeds, following the law, keeping the commandments, whatever. Didn't get their expected end. And as a result, they pouted. They got angry. And they said of John who came pointing to Christ, trying to reconcile the children with the fathers. They said to him, he hath the devil. And then Christ finally showed up. And they said, he's gluttonous. He's a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. He's a sinner himself. They rejected the Messiah. The Bible records, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And that verse continues, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And I believe that's the press that we're seeing. Those that for the first time ever are hearing this good news and they are charging at the kingdom of heaven trying to receive of that wonderful gift of Christ. <clears throat> there's one that received him not, his own, and there's one here now that I believe are violently trying to take the kingdom of heaven by force. The other group, of course, is simply violently rejecting it. We want nothing to do with this, pushing it away, blaspheming the messenger, and then blaspheming the Son of Man as he arrives. Continue on in verse 20. It says, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. So now Christ is talking about, I've done works in this place and that place. I've done all of these great things, and he's going to upbraid them. In other words, he's going to give them a tongue lashing because... They repented not. And remember, Christ at this time had come specifically and almost exclusively to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he told his disciples. Go not to the highways and hedges yet, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what does Christ say of them? He began to upbraid the cities, verse 20, wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. He says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works were, were done in you, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, then, or they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So though he suffered them, and though he sent prophets, and though he even sent at the very end John the Baptist, and then after that he sent his disciples that he specifically taught, and now he is there upbraiding them, though they have God had long suffered with his own people, his own people received him not, he even did miracles, he even showed signs and wonders that he withheld from the unbelieving world specifically to reach them for the great love that he had for them, and they rejected him viciously have rejected him and said they want nothing to do with the Son of Man at this time. And you can go with me now to Romans chapter 9. So what I believe he is showing to his disciples, remember, he just taught them that they're to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and they're to preach. So they're to um, specifically preach and give to these people. They're, he's trying to reach them. He's trying to, he's trying to let them see 
the great miracles and signs and prove that Almighty God has arrived and the kingdom of God is at hand. He said, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And here it was, the lost sheep of the house of Israel that turned him away. And so Christ is saying now, follow me into the world. He's transitioned. He's starting to ease off of teaching and preaching unto the people of the house of Israel. Why? Because they are by and large rejecting him. They don't have ears to hear. They are dumb to it. Here he says in Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, it says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. So here's Christ, or here's um, yeah, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, essentially through the Apostle Paul, showing his great love and heaviness and sorrow of heart towards his people. It says, verse 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, who are the fathers and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever." Amen. So here the Apostle Paul shows his great heaviness. I believe that's Christ putting that in his heart to speak of his sorrow for his people Israel. And he says, I wish that I could be accursed from Christ if only that they could all be saved. They are Israelites indeed, according to what? The flesh. The adoption pertaineth unto them. The glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God. All that was rendered in the law and the prophets applies unto them but they don't want the Christ that fulfilled those very laws and prophets. And verse 6 continues and talks about that Bible and that word that came forth. It says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. So the Bible doesn't become of none effect simply because these Israelites, according to the flesh, have rejected the adoption, have rejected the glory, have rejected the covenants, have rejected the giving of law, have rejected the service of God, have rejected God, Almighty God, the word of God is not taken of none effect. It says this, For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Interesting. He's saying then, the promises still apply, but they apply into a different group. They don't apply to those Israelites according to the flesh, but they apply to this spiritual Israel. And it says here in verse 7, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, watch this, these are not the children of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It says, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And who was this promised? Well, the Bible says that the seed is Christ. We're counted for the seed. So if you are in Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So of course God suffered his people. Of course God loved his people, extended his love to his people, sent the law, sent the prophets to reveal himself to them, sent his preachers to highlight their sins and try to draw them to repentance. At last he sent John the Baptist, that great and notable preacher, the greatest born among women, to cry out, He is coming! He is coming! He is coming! This is the one which I was talking about, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And they rejected John, all the prophets previous, and they rejected Christ and wanted nothing to do with him. And therefore, they willingly accepted that they would step away from being the heirs. Verse 25, there in that same Romans chapter 9, it says, As he saith also in Ozi, and that's Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Okay, so he's saying there's a group that was not his people, but he's got a new group that he's going to call his people. The ones that were not beloved, he's going to call them beloved. In verse 26, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall be called 
they be called the children of the living God. And isn't that amazing that even Christ prophesied that it would be better for these, these places. It would be better for, for example, Sodom. It would be better for Tyre and Sidon than it would be for his own people in their own cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, because they rejected the Christ. And the prophets came and told them they needed to accept him. Verse 27, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of, of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Verse 29, And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us his seed, we had been like unto Sodom and made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. So the prophets came and cried concerning the Lord and cried concerning the need for salvation by faith and they rejected it here. And therefore, the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, which did ha not have the promise, the scriptures at their disposal, they had no way of accessing the righteousness of God because they didn't even understand what was being preached by and large as a group. He said, they've attained unto righteousness, which is the righteousness of of faith back in Matthew chapter 11 and what a gift that was for them because these were constantly trying to please their gods and serve idols and follow after the gods of the nations and and everything would be really confusing for them because most of these religions it's like it's like last days Babylon her ways are movable that thou canst not know them you never really know what you're doing because there's never really a firm standard we have a standard this is our standard for all matters of faith and practice. It is the authority that we follow the word of God, and yet these religions don't have that. And so they have a whole system of doing and being and trying set up to try to appease their gods so that they can get to whatever they call their kingdom. And then Christ comes in and says, don't do anything, trust me. And you can now understand why there would be a great violent force pressing upon Christ. And you found that all the time. He couldn't even move at times for the press that was upon him. If you've ever been to like a rock show or something, or really in a busy marketplace, and you've really been in a press, I mean, that is, that is a violent feeling. You're, you're, you're pushed this way and that. You can't move. You can't breathe. You, you can't, for the press, do a thing because of the force that's upon you. The violent take that kingdom of heaven by force. And this, I believe, is talking about the new group known as the Gentiles that Christ is going to seek to reach. The Gentiles were ignorant of God's righteousness, which is Christ. And they received him as a result by faith when he came preaching when before they followed after their own righteousness and then sadly god's people decided to go the ways of the gentiles fall after their own righteousness and therefore they rejected there was a switch that has taken place at this time as god opened up the opportunity for salvation to the gentiles of course they could always be saved but as a group they weren't being actively reached by Christ, just as the apostles were sent, not actively reaching the Gentiles, but God's own people. That's what happened by and large in the Old Testament. But the Jews were to be, and Israel was to be a light to the Gentiles. That was always their commission. Through their service and through their uh, works and through their deeds and their love for their neighbors, they were supposed to be a light unto them, to show them the way so that the unbelieving world would become Israel in the same way. They would join up with them and they would serve the living God as a result. But they rejected that commission and therefore God turned to the Gentiles. And we see the Apostle Paul highlighting that, though he had a great love for the Jews and Israel by and large. So here now, babes, or the world at large, is being reached by Christ. So why would they be babes? Let's look back in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25. Now Christ is going to give this thankful, rejoicing prayer unto God for what's about to take place. Remember, there's a group that has heard from John 
until Jesus of the kingdom of heaven and now it suffereth violence as a result of this group. Then there's the group that before that doesn't have ears to hear, has rejected. Christ highlights that they think that they are doing the right things and should receive a right reward from God, but he says it'll be more tolerable in the day of judgment for these unbelieving nations than it shall be for you because I've always been trying to reach you and trying to work with you and trying to lead you unto myself. In verse 25, Jesus says, At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Israel, according to the flesh, thought they knew it all. They were wise. They were prudent. They had the scriptures. They had the works. They had the regimen. They had everything down. They thought that they had really made it. They were self-righteous and therefore unbelieving. And God says through Jesus here, I'm thankful, Father, that you've hid these things from the Gentiles. Why is it a great thing that these things have been hid from them? Because now they're ready to receive it, big time. And when you think about it, who's harder to reach? Those that are wise and prudent and religious and scholars, and they, they have it all worked out and they know exactly what they're doing, like a dyed-in-the-wool Catholic or, or a dyed-in-the-wool practicing Muslim. Who's harder to reach, that person or the person that just really doesn't have anything they follow? They don't believe anything. They're just kind of, ah, eh, well, teach me. I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Those people are far more receptive than the person that has it all figured out. And they're babes when it comes to understanding of the kingdom of God. God has hid these things from the wise and prudent. In other words, he has blinded their minds, blinded their eyes. He has made them deaf of hearing, dumb of hearing. They couldn't, they couldn't receive what God was saying unto him, but God chose to receive it, un, reveal it unto babes. Verse 26 it says, Even so, Father, for so it seemeth good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father but the Son, and he to whom the Son shall reveal him. So God here is indicating, and Christ is thankful, that he's now got that ministry of revealing himself to these. So again, he was going after a different group before this transition that took place in Matthew chapter 11. And now he is preparing to reveal himself to this other group, these babes, babes in understanding, babes that had no law, had no instruction, had no hope, but now they have Christ, and Christ is revealing himself unto them. Jesus here begins to make it very clear that his desire is to reach the world. A lot of people will presume, as I've said before, that Jesus was a Jew that sought about reaching Jews and then because they rejected him, the Jews became an afterthought. Well, I don't think that's the case at all because Christ here is indicating through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that so it seemed good in thy sight, verse 16. He said, even so, Father, it seemed good in thy sight. To what? To hide these things from the wise and prudent, now revealing them unto babes. It was God's plan all along to go to the Gentiles as Christ arrived on the scene. And Jesus wasn't a Jew. A Jew is a religious believer of Judaism. Jesus was not a, a, a Pharisee. He was not a part of, of that, the Kabbalah and that sort of thing. And these high-level weirdo witchcraft things that go on in Judaism at large. The religion of the Pharisees, which is from the Babylonian Talmud and all that all that wickedness that they brought with them, and the oral uh, traditions that they carry down through the ages. Jesus was not a Jew. He wasn't part of that. He was of that nation of Israel, yes, of course, through Mary and through, through adoption of his, of his stepfather Joseph and through the lineage of David and all those things. Yeah, of course, but Jesus came to reach the world. He came to reach sinners. That's the biggest thing. He came to reach sinners, so that's everybody. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Christ Jesus came to this earth to save sinners, of whom I have chief. He didn't come just to save the Jews. Okay, So here he is clearly indicating that he has a desire to the world. Clearly, his word has not been understood at all by the ones that had the biggest opportunity to receive it. They rejected it. They confused it. They made it their own thing. They, they, they sought God after their own will and after their own counsel. So here he opens it up and he says this into the whole world. Verse 28, Come unto me, 
all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's revealing that wonderful yoke that is in Christ, which is simply a faithful heart. And there you'll find rest for your soul. There you can cease from your own works and trust in the works that Christ offers. Christ, I believe, is showing his disciples, follow me. We're going to reach the world now. You, you, you went to your own people. You have went to all your cities. And look what your cities did. They despised you. They rejected you. They stopped their ears. They saw the miracles and attributed it to something else. They saw the Son of Man and said that he's gluttonous, a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. They saw John the Baptist, the forerunner, and they said, He hath the devil. They rejected him. They wanted nothing to do with him. Christ says, Hey, we're going to the Gentiles. Follow me. We're, we're going to the Gentiles. In verse 12, chapter 12 and verse 1, watch this. And it says, And at that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and eat. Now we're going to get a few more examples of what the walk in Jewry was like for Christ and his disciples. What the, what the, the reach and, and missionary trips and opportunities to, to preach were like when he went in among his own people. Verse 2, it says, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful upon the Sabbath days. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and how they, how they that were with him how that he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. See, they're focusing on the doing and the ritual and the rigmarole, and Christ is standing right in front of them. There's one standing in front of you that is greater than all of this. In verse 7, it says, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. So Christ is bringing the battle to their gates. He's charging in there straight away and he's saying, look, you're not reading the scriptures. You are not understanding the scriptures. For if ye had known what this all meaneth, then you would not have condemned me. You would have not have condemned the guiltless and you would have not missed the fact that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In other words, I desire to give you something that you don't deserve. I don't want you to give me a bunch of things that I don't need. God has no need for the sacrifice of men, but he wants to do mercy unto them and give them that gift of eternal life. He says that they need to read. They need to read. They need to understand what this all means. And he's talking here to religious Jews. Then he decides to go into their synagogue. Continuing on in verse 10, it says, And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, basically, they've heard what he said about David. They've heard what he said about the law. And so now that he's walked into their religious building, they say, well, here we go. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might accuse them. So now they're going to set him up to be accused for misconstruing, misapplying, and sinning against the laws that they have set up to worship. Verse 11, it says, And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into the pit on a Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on him and lift him out? So he asked them, knowingly, you guys have broken your own Sabbath. <laughs> you have a sheep that will fall into a pit and you're to rest on the Sabbath day. You'll certainly lift him out. And I don't believe Jesus is faulting him for that. But what he is faulting them for is the hypocrisy that they would attack Christ for healing a man on the Sabbath day. And so he says this, verse 12, How much more, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on Sabbath days. He charges into their synagogue, which was supposed to be 
a house of God, and he asks them this pointed question as they ask them this point of question. Do you not think that a man is greater than your sheep? Do you not think that the men that I'm now going to, the Gentiles, are much more important than your school of sheeple proselytes that you heap to yourselves in your religious ceremony and service and rigmarole? Do you not think that there is something greater than what you are doing here as you condemn the guiltless? Verse 13, he saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like is the other. He just says, you know what? This man is so much greater than those sheep that you'll break the Sabbath for. But you won't do good unto this man. You won't do good unto another human so that you can keep your ritual hypocrites. This is the exact problem the Old Testament shows us. You were to be a light to the Gentiles. You were supposed to help others. You were supposed to heal others. You were supposed to lead people to the light that was in the children of Israel, which was God, Almighty God. And instead, you made a religion out of it. Christ says, I want nothing to do with that sacrifice. I want mercy. You're healed. As an example of what's to come. And the Pharisees played out exactly what he had already decided. Verse 14, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. You know, Jesus had already basically said, well, you know, go to destruction. Fine. And so now they've turned their anger back at him and said, you know what? Let's find a way to destroy him. Why? Because he showed power that he has in heaven and demonstrated it on earth, which also indicates that he has power to forgive sins. And he showed that at the beginning of Matthew. His power on earth over healing and over diseases and over ailments was simply there so he could show that he has power to heal them of their sins. What is harder to say? We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Continuing on, verse 14, the Pharisees hold a council how they might destroy them. Verse 15, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. So see, Christ leaves these rejecting Judaizer Pharisees leaves off. And what does he have? A multitude still pressing unto them. And it says, and he healed them all. Verse 16, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. And watch this. And he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, smoking flax shall he not quench, till he shall send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Christ here says, look, I came to you with great miracles. I came to you with great signs. I sent you prophets upon prophets upon prophets. And which one of my prophets have ye not persecuted? Which one of my prophets and their word have ye not rejected? Now you want this great sacrificial religion, but the only thing you're sacrificing is the love that you should give to your brethren around you, your, your neighbors, according to the flesh. Christ says, I will have mercy. He heals the, the sick one that had approached him with a withered hand. I believe he was likely a, a Gentile, which was probably why they were so hate, hating against him for doing so. They hold a council about how they might destroy them. Christ heals it, walks away, and in doing so, fulfills the scripture in Isaiah that the Spirit would go upon him, that he would not strive nor cry. Neither any man hear his voice in the streets. In other words, he didn't have to struggle to get a following. He didn't have to cry aloud in order for people to come unto him. Rather, he just went about doing good, the Bible says. It's a very passive explanation of Christ. Jesus went about doing good, just, just went about to and fro, here and there, just walking about doing good, even telling people, don't make a big deal of it. Don't make this thing known, even though he healed them all. A bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth victory, and it says, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. And so we see very early in Christ's ministry that he had a plan to go to the Gentiles. His plan wasn't to bring a bunch of 
Christ rejecting, unbelieving, religious Pharisees along with him for the ride. No. He brought a few, 12, namely disciples. Told them to go into their own cities. There's not much commentary about what actually happened, but I believe the subsequent chapters indicate that even as John went and preached, was cast into prison, I believe the disciples went to their own cities and were rejected by and large. But Christ goes, he preaches the kingdom of heaven. From that time that John came until, until uh, Jesus in his ministry stepped forward, the kingdom suffereth violence and the violent taken by force. There's a press to get into the, what Christ is offering. But we see all along that, that undercurrent of the unbelieving religious Israel according to the flesh that's rejecting him. They had the prophets. He says, this is that Elias. You know, when we read the book of Revelation and we see that very last chapter, it's like if Christ came to us and he recorded, hey, hey, this is exactly what I was talking about. The plagues being added to your, um, to your name if you reject what is written in this book. This is exactly what I was saying when I said, surely I cometh quickly, right? He, he's pointing the Jews to the, to the very last page of their book. And he's saying, here it is. Wake up. And then he says, if you have ears to hear, hear this. But then he likens that generation very quickly just to, just to rejecting him by and large. We did all these great works for you, God, and you didn't do what we wanted. Your prophet's a devil and you're a wine-bibber. You love sinners. And so he says, well, you know what then? It'll be more tolerable for Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom than it will be for you in your day of judgment. I go unto the Gentiles. Father, I thank you that you withheld these things from those unbelievers so that I can go to the Gentiles and they will receive. They will enter into my rest. And then he squares off again with Pharisees who reject him outright and take counsel how they might destroy him. Here he in many ways seals his fate. Why? Because they probably saw that his heart was toward a people that they rejected for their own pride and wickedness and arrogancy. And so he says, I will go to the Gentiles. And verse 22 just nails that. In his name shall the Gentiles trust. Exactly what Isaiah the prophet said is exactly what's happening here. And Christ says, follow me. Look, this gospel is for the whole world. This gospel is not for us, like, black people, for Asian people, for Indian people. The gospel is not for a particular people group. It's not only for the Jews. The gospel is not for men. It's not for women. It's for everybody. Red and yellow, black and white, male, female. Right? The gospel is for everybody, young and old. It's for the world. And Christ here is showing that. Follow me, he says, as I go to the world. Follow me. And that's where he bids us to go. I love these teachings. They're great. Thank you, God, for this day.